This screencast is the lecture for Dr. Faustus. Theater productions are usually classified as either tragedies or comedies. Which of these is Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, do you think? Certainly there are, com are elements of both in the play. Some scenes are incredibly dark and heavy, while others are, are really just goofy and lighthearted. Most students find these comedic interludes in the play jarring and out of place. Think about what the play would be like without them, though. Some scholars think that those scenes uh, might have been added by a later playwright, while others contend that Marlowe wrote them into the play himself. In my opinion, both sides make good arguments. First and foremost, they do seem out of place in such a dark drama. I mean, Faustus is selling his soul to the devil for Pete's sake. The play would be so much more powerful without the comic scenes. On the other hand, you have to think about those Renaissance audiences that saw the play for the first time. Remember, Marlowe is the first writer to compose plays in blank verse, making the dialogue sound so much more realistic. Truth be told, many of those early audiences were absolutely terrified by this play. Some thought that actual devils appeared on stage and carried the actor playing Faustus off to hell. The comic scenes would have reassured them that they were just watching a play, uh, that it was all right and going the way that it should. If you think about it, many horror movies today include humor in them. Some, like Scary Movie, really play up the comedy aspect, while more traditional horror movies are much more subtle. It may, might not be slapstick like we see in Faustus, but it's there in almost all of them, nonetheless. Let's look at some specific aspects of the play. First, there is Faustus's search for knowledge. I mean, that's at the heart of this whole play, isn't it? Is it wrong to want knowledge? Is there any knowledge that we shouldn't have? If so, what is it? The big question is where does morality come into play with knowledge? In other words, can we think of knowledge as either moral or immoral? If so, what makes one um, knowledge one way or the other? When Dr. Faustus uh, signs his soul over to Satan, his blood congeals. Even his own body is rejecting the agreement, telling him not to do this thing. Does he sell his soul cheaply, do you think? Look at the contract together. On these conditions following. First, that Faustus may be a spirit in form and substance. Secondly, that Mephistopheles shall be his servant and at his command. Thirdly, that Mephistopheles shall do for him and bring him whatsoever. Fourthly, that he shall be in his chamber or house invisible. Lastly, that he shall appear to the said John Faustus at all times in what form or shape soever he please. I, John Faustus of Wittenberg, doctor by these presents, do give both body and soul to Lucifer, prince of the east, and his minister Mephistopheles, and furthermore grant unto them that twenty-four years being expired, the articles above written inviolate full power to fetch or carry the said John Faustus body and soul, flesh and blood, or goods, into their habitation wheresoever by me John Faustus so he's selling his soul for just 24 years of of this type of life um, but this idea of selling your soul for something that you want badly appears throughout literature and uh, because of Faustus and this play the trade is called a Faustian bargain it's easy for people to say that they'd never make such a bargain but if you think about it, it could happen to any of us. On a totally philosophical level, we make such bargains any time that we cheat on an exam or on our significant other. We rationalize that the end justifies the means, just like Faustus does. We sell a little piece of our soul to get what we want. On a more literal level, is there anything, anything that you'd be willing to sell your soul for? Think about someone you love deeply who is suffering horribly. Would you be willing to do anything to help them? Would you sacrifice your soul for them? This idea of the Faustian bargain, then, is not such a clear-cut decision. Faustus's bargain, of course, was not based upon a matter of life and death, but upon knowledge. Would that be worth it, do you think? Anyway, we see Faustian bargains everywhere, 
in music, for instance, with the Charlie ba Daniels Band, The Devil Went Down to Georgia, um, The Devil and Satan have a, uh, a duel of fiddling, and uh, if the uh, guy doesn't win, he loses his soul to the devil, and if the devil wins, then the guy gets his, I mean, if the guy wins, then he gets the devil's uh, gold fiddle. We also have it in movies, people willing to sell their soul for a chance at the American dream. In graphic novels, Dr. Faustus has been transformed into an evil character who fights Captain America. There's even a Garfield cartoon based upon Dr. Faustus. If you want to read it, you'll just have to pause this and then continue on. And of course, there's The Simpsons. You just know that Bart is more than ready to make a deal. Anyway, getting back to the play, Faustus has grand ideas of what he'll do with power. Had I as many souls as there be stars, I'd give them all for Mephistopheles. By him I'll be great emperor of the world, and make a bridge through the moving air to pass the ocean with a band of men. I'll join the hills that bind the Afric shore, and make that land continent to Spain, and both contributory to my crown. The emperor shall not live but by my leave, nor any potentate in Germany. Now that I have obtained what I desire, I'll live in speculation of this art till Mephistopheles return again. So, uh, Faustus has these grand ideas of what he's going to do uh, with his magical powers. Uh, but how do the, those ideas really equate with the reality of the situation? What he ends up doing is little more than cheap tricks. He's like an illusionist or a magician. Certainly he does not, nothing worth selling his soul for. Every time Faustus asks for something from Mephistopheles, he's disappointed in the result. For instance, the very first thing he asks for is a wife, but Mephistopheles can't deliver on that because marriage is a holy sacrament of the church. He brings Faustus a she-devil instead. When Faustus asks about hell, Mephistopheles is very evasive. Whenever Faustus begins to recognize that he didn't get much of a bargain, mostly because of the angel-devil debate going on on his shoulders, he's given a book of some sort to distract him from that recognition. One of the uh, distractions occurs when Lucifer attempts to turn Faustus away from thinking about Christ in scene 5, line 263. Lucifer has the seven deadly sins performed for Faustus. He's doing everything he can to keep Faustus more interested in hell than in heaven. Faustus goes to Rome and plays tricks on the Pope. How does this compare to this fantasy about uh, the power he would receive in exchange for his soul? Why isn't he doing all those godlike things that he imagined? One possibility is that the human mind is simply too limited in its scope. We can't imagine things with the same complexity as God. When you think about it, how much power has Faustus really gained through his bargain with the devil? All it seems he can do are small magic tricks. Mephistopheles seems to keep all the power for himself. So why doesn't Faustus just repent? What does he believe in? He says that he doesn't believe in hell, and you would think that he doesn't believe doesn't because he's willing to chance spending eternity there. On the other hand, he must believe in Satan because he's willing to turn his back on God in exchange for the power that Satan can give him. The play is so perfectly written that it contains a total of 13 scenes. Did you notice that? In the final scene, Faustus's time is running out. Open your book to the final scene and uh, read Faustus's final speech along with me, and it starts on line 57. Faustus. Ah, Faustus, how hast thou but one bare hour to live, and then thou must be damned perpetually. Stand still, you ever-moving spheres of heaven, that time may cease and midnight never come. Fair nature's eye, rise, rise again, and make perpetual day, or let this hour be but a year, a month, a week, a natural day that Faustus may repent and save his soul. O oh, lente one seventy two lente curete noctis equi, the stars move still, time runs, the clock will strike, the devil will come, and Faustus must be damned. Oh, I leap up to my God, who pulls me down? 
See, see where Christ's blood streams in the firmament. One drop would save my soul, half a drop. Ah, oh, my Christ, ah, rend not my heart for naming of my Christ, yet will I call on him, O oh, spare me, Lucifer. Where is it now? Tis gone. And see where God stretches out his arm and bends his ireful brows. Mountains and hills, come, come and fall on me and hide me from the heavy wrath of God. No, no. Then will I headlong run into the earth. Earth gape. Oh no, it will not harbor me. You stars that reigned at my nativity, whose influence hath allotted death and hell. Now draw up Faustus like a foggy mist into the entrails of yon laboring clouds, that when you vomit forth into the air my limbs may issue from your smoky mouth, so that my soul may but ascend to heaven. The clock strikes the half hour. Ah, half of the hour is past, twill all be past anon, O God, if thou wilt not have mercy on my soul. Yet for Christ's sake, whose blood hath ransomed me, impose some end to my incessant pain. Let Faustus live in hell a thousand years, a hundred thousand, and at last be saved. Oh, no end is limited to damned soul. Why wert thou not a creature wanting soul, or why is this immortal that thou hast? Ah, Pythagoras's metempsychosis, were, were that truth, this soul should fly from me, and I be changed unto some brutish beast. All beasts are happy, for when they die their souls are soon dissolved in elements, but mine must live still to be plagued in hell. Cursed be the parents that engendered me. No, Faustus, curse thyself, curse Lucifer, that hath deprived thee of the joys of heaven. The clock strikes twelve. Oh, it strikes, it strikes. Now body turn to air, or Lucifer will bear thee quick to hell. Thunder and lightning. O oh, soul, be changed into little water drops and fall into the ocean, never to be found. The devil sent her. My God, my God, look not so fierce on me. Adders and serpents, let me breathe a while. Ugly hell, cape not. Come not, Lucifer. I'll burn my brooks. Ah, Mephistopheles. This is high drama, even for a bad actor like me. The other existing version of the text doesn't have the epilogue. Think about how shaken that medieval audience would have been if the play had simply ended with Faustus's cry. So, what do you think? Does Faustus repent at the end, or is it too late? Is he carried off to an eternity in hell? Marlowe leaves us with a lot of questions, not only about the ill-fated Dr. Faustus, but about ourselves as well.